Hello, everybody. Um, my name is John Harkins. I am the events associate for the French American Chamber of Commerce New York chapter. And we are happy to welcome you to our event today, Assessing City Resiliency and Planning for a Better Future, created in collaboration with Capgemini Applied Innovation Exchange. The FACC's mission is to provide the opportunities, experiences, and understanding that empower successful business relationships between and for members. Um, now, before we begin, I'd like to just give a, a quick rundown of what this event is going to look like. Uh, the event will be split into two parts, respectively. Um, in a couple moments, we will begin. We will welcome our panel onto the stage, where we will have 45 minutes or so of uh, panel discussion. Feel free to throw your questions into the Q&A function to the right of the screen and we will try our best to get to all of them. After that, we will be released into the networking portion, uh, something you saw very briefly when you just joined the event. During the networking portion of the event, you're able to jump from table to table by double-clicking and hovering over the table. Um, we will launch discussion topics so you can move freely around the tables and you know, not feel like you're lost when you do. And when you're in the networking part of the event, you'll also be able to click on four surrounding logos, which have links to FACC info, and smart city case studies done by Capgemini. If anyone is experiencing any technical difficulties, I saw a couple with a couple people who may have been, been in the tutorial. Um, there are help buttons all over the bottom of your screen to help you. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Alex Lee of Fahrenheit 212 and for a couple of notes. Alex? Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alex Lee. I'm an engagement manager at Fahrenheit 212. Um, which is part of Capgemini. We are the innovation group within Capgemini. Uh, we also work closely with the Applied Innovation Exchange, which is another branch of, of Capgemini here in North America. Um, we're excited to put on this event today in partnership with the French American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have a really interesting panel discussion for the next 45 minutes. Uh, we've brought together a great group from different industries uh, with the goal of having a conversation around how to build resilient cities and lessons learned from COVID with a particular focus on um, shared spaces and transportation systems. Um, our goal here today was to start to have a conversation across industries. As we all know, um, the challenges facing our cities and the solutions required to address them require collaboration from different industries. Um, there are many interesting events going on in this space today. Um, unfortunately, we don't often see collaboration across industries. So uh, Chrissy, who I've had the pleasure of working with for quite some time now, is going to lead a conversation that hopes to address that issue. Um, we're going to ask questions to each of our panelists about their specific industries, but then move into a conversation um, that starts to drive at collaboration and some of the challenges of addressing the complex um, uh, issues facing cities today and how we might create solutions for that. So that's all you'll hear from me. I'll be around at the tables. Um, some of my colleagues from Fahrenheit 212 and Capgemini are here. So please find us after in the, the uh, networking portion. And with that, I'll give it to Chrissy and, and get off. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Chrissy Fanganello here. Honored to be able to host the panel today. I am an urban planner by training and spent the bulk of my career working in transportation in the public sector. Uh, what I love about city planning is the complexity that Alex was just alluding to, the, the policy, the physical space and design, and yes, even the ongoing administration and regulation. Um, those are all important aspects, even though some of them may be less fun than others. Uh, and now more than ever, the innovation in the space of transportation and mobility is super exciting. And it's what brought me to Panasonic Smart Mobility Office a couple, almost two years ago, uh, but with the goal of really helping the public sector and the private sector better understand one another. And in order to build the right technology solutions through a co-development process, with an eye towards scaling and thus being able to solve problems across multiple cities, countries, and quite frankly, the globe. Um, if we are able to do so, that would be amazing. Um, the French American Chamber of Commerce in New York has assembled an impressive panel of speakers today. Uh, before asking uh, uh, the panelists to introduce themselves, I'm just gonna speak a little bit and give you a little bit of color about the organizations that they represent. 
Uh, Eric is with Clip Bike. It's a Brooklyn-based startup whose mission is making e-bike technology more affordable and more accessible to everyone. Huge believer in that. Way to go, Eric. Uh, John is with Urban Green. He is it's an environmental nonprofit organization dedicated to the transformation, transforming buildings for a sustainable future. The organization has been instrumental in climate and resiliency initiatives in New York City over its 18-year history. And finally, Mahal is with Dassault Systems. It's a global company headquartered outside of Paris with 20,000 people dedicated to helping customers implement solutions to harmonize products, nature, and life through their 3D experience platform. The 3D, ex the, yeah, the 3D experience platform embodies nearly 40 years of innovation serving multiple industries to support software development, product design, simulation, and lifecycle management from an engineering approach into a collaborative digital workplace. Now I'll ask our panel members, our panel to share with us their experience and insights about building resilient cities with a special focus on shared spaces and transportation systems. More specifically, we'll be talking about the lessons COVID has revealed about how cities and their partners are succeeding or failing at ensuring safe, reliable, and usable space and transportation systems for their citizens, and more broadly, how cities and their partners can create better solutions in the future. I would like to now invite each panelist to introduce themselves. So welcome, Eric. Hi, Chrissy. Thanks for having us, and thanks for the Chamber of Commerce to organizing that virtually, um, almost together with those uh, that technology, and that's great to be here. Uh, so very quickly, I'm going to, I think we have a lot of time to discuss the topic. So uh, briefly, Clip, I'm the CFO of Clip.bike. It's a clean mobility startup based in, in Brooklyn at the Navy Yard here, the, the new lab. Um, with my two partners, we are now launching Clip, which is a lightweight, portable, all-in-one device that you can easily attach to any bicycle's front fork to transform your bike instantly into an e-bike. So you just need to pull down the, the clamp and you ride your bike normally. It is intended to make cycling easy as it delivers 45 to 60 minutes uh, pedal assist ride or 10 to 15 miles. You can just recharge clip at home or at the office on your desk as you would do for, for a cell phone. And uh, the launch price is $3.99. So it's extremely affordable being one sixth of, a, of the price of a decent e-bike. We're gonna sell online direct and our prime markets are commuters and recreational users in the US and in Europe. We're starting with the US launch uh, early uh, spring next year and we're taking pre-orders already. Um, one of the main reasons people don't bike to work uh, more often is because um, as we have confirmed with many uh, customer interviews is that they do not want to arrive uh, at work sweaty. And as much as their heart or mind desire it, it can just be very hard to bike up, you know, 10 to 50, four to 10, 10 miles a day for any regular people, especially going, you know, above bridges and hills. So to solve that problem, an e-bike is perfect, right? More than double your range. The thing is with e-bikes, it's expensive, it's heavy, and they all often get stolen because they are expensive uh, bikes. So that's where Clip comes in. It's just very easy. Uh, to adopt the e-bike technology. It's affordable and accessible. So it's just, you know, enabling plug and play e-bike functionality on any bike at a fraction of cost and complexity. So that's what I would say as an intro. Fantastic, thanks, Eric. I can totally appreciate the challenges you're trying to solve. I actually bought my first e-bike four years ago for that very reason. I had an eight mile commute and going down to the office was great. It was downhill, but coming home uh -huh. in the on a hot day it was a little bit brutal. Um, so next up is John with Urban Green. Thanks, Chrissy. It's great to join my panelists, Eric and Mahal, and I want to thank uh, John and Alex for uh, for organizing um, the event. So I'd love to get into the discussion today about really the intersections that we're, that we're starting to emerge and see that were already there, but just a little bit more uncovered now between resiliency, climate, health, laid bare in this particular uh, pandemic. And I'd love to get into those with the panel. Um, Urban Green, as Chrissy uh, mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization, um, environmental group, um, stakeholder organization. We have members um, that support us and foundations and, and, and governments. Um, 
you know, we work to lower the carbon footprint of buildings. Um, and that's extraordinarily important when it comes to resiliency, obviously. Um, but there's also this um, unspoken benefit right now that with those carbon reductions, yes, there's a climate benefit, but there's an equal health benefit that in today's days may actually outstrip financially, at least for the short term, the climate benefit. And so uh, there's certainly those intersections that you know we'd love to discuss. At Urban Green, we do four things. Uh, we convene uh, to bring parties together to solve big problems. We've been doing that throughout the course of our 18 year history. Mayor Bloomberg, for example, appointed Urban Green to develop the city's resiliency plan after Superstorm Sandy. In that exercise, we brought together 300 people over the course of just a year to develop that plan with 17 recommendations enacted by the city council. Second thing we do is research. Typically when we convene, we identify problems that need answers and data. That's where the research comes in. So our, our second um, function is in research and and really filling data needs for policies to be enacted or for the market to move. Um, it's not research for research sakes, it's, it's action oriented. Third thing we do is advocacy. We can get into that in the course of the panel. We just passed uh, in New York City, um, the largest carbon reduction of any city in the world uh, uh, concerning buildings and Urban Green was front and center in, in helping to shepherd uh, that new law. And the fourth thing we do is education. We, edu we educate uh, architects and engineers on energy code. We uh, educate the building trades actually across the United States and Canada with training partners on how to better operate uh, buildings. So that's uh, kind of the Urban Green overview in a nutshell. Fantastic. Thanks so much, John. And there's, uh, I'm going to linger on education for a minute. My husband actually works in the uh, uh, energy resiliency space as well. And he does a lot of uh, blower door tests and airtight tests. And he works with, uh, you know, inspectors across the country, across the Colorado range. And they just, they just don't know, you know, they see the test as something new that, you know, and say things like buildings need to breathe. So how do we like really ramp up this education that's needed across the industry and across the different sectors. So I'm glad you're here today. Uh, last but not least, Mahal with the Salt Systems. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you very much, everyone. Really happy to be here today and, and, and share the, the stage with you, John and Eric. Great, great event. Um, just a, a quick word about Dassault System. Uh, we've been uh, created in uh, 1981. We uh, define ourselves as a scientific company and a software provider. Basically, um, we are um, the champions of virtual universes. So what it means is we help our client, mainly uh, coming from uh, the industry, and I'll define what industry means in a minute, uh, uh, imagine what could be the future of their assets. So design it, um, simulate it, um, eventually also manufacture it, and once they're built, operate it with a, a full suite of software that are helping them put together the right processes to reach what we call the PLM, Product Lifecycle Management. At each of these stages, we have different technologies that I, that I mentioned, and basically we help people that are manufacturing or, or, or imagining uh, planes, uh, cars, train, uh, buildings, uh, uh, conceive the next generation of assets. So go beyond what they could ever imagine in terms of innovation. Uh, my job is to bring this portfolio of technologies and knowledge and know-how within the public sector. So I'm myself responsible to work with the administration, governments, to help them understand that nowadays these technologies that indeed have been initiated in industrial ecosystem have a lot of value when it comes to build what we call a digital twin approach. The digital twin being a virtual representation of the asset with its full uh, data, with its full properties to help manage better. Manage better, it could be a territory, it could be a city, it could be a building. And, and we have seen during the unfortunately COVID-19 crisis that a lot of these technologies have tremendous value for our, our public partners. And, and I'm really happy to share that with you today and discuss with the panel on this topic. Fantastic, thank you, Mahal. And, and uh, you know, this is a space that I think is so interesting, having spent much of my career in the public sector and how we think about the public right of way um, and how it is managed or not managed as an asset. And then also how we di display it. You know, when we draw pictures of it, it makes it look pretty and organized. But if anyone's ever opened up a street before, that's, 
that's not never what you get. So uh, we will have an exciting and fun conversation today. I think we can all dork out together, honestly. Um, to the audience that's listening, feel free to contribute questions to the question and answer section on your screen as we go along, and we'll try to uh, keep up with you. Um, we're going to start with questions, a question for each of our panelists, and then we'll just sort of open it up for conversation between everyone on the panel today. So my first question is, to kick off the conversation will be for you, Eric. Um, curious to know more about how your experience in the automotive industry led you to creating a micromobility startup uh, that's focused on sustainable mode of transportation with bicycling. And what do you see as the most important considerations for sustainable, resilient transportation in our cities? And how is the industry uh, going to have to shift and how we're thinking about it and how we're innovating into the future? Very simple question. Thank you, Chrissy. <laughs> So, I mean, let me continue then maybe on a quick uh, quick intro. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to work uh, uh, on, in the sustainable transportation uh, for many years, in fact, uh, including the launch of the Nissan Leaf when I used to be with Nissan North America. Uh, so the Nissan Leaf being the first mass market electric vehicle. And that was already 10 years ago, 2010, 11. Uh, and that opened my eyes on the future of clean transportation. And since then, I've been involved in many different startups. I created my own startup, which is, was a SaaS, so um, service as a software solution, uh, helping companies um, select the best uh, cars or vehicles for their fleet. So basically looking at the total cost of ownership optimization and very often leading to a choice in terms of right-sizing the vehicle and in terms of you know alternative um, fuel technologies such as electric vehicles, of course, hybrids, etc., and, and natural gas. So that was the, you know, the evolution from the corporate world, uh, Nissan and GM before, and even Alstom in the past, to the startup world. So that was, in fact, a inter very interesting transition. And I did not, did not stop there because then I had a chance to meet with um, a company which wanted, a French company, as a matter of fact, which wanted to come to the U.S., open the office in the U.S., and they had a great dispatch te technology, basically the same platform that you have for Uber, but applying to taxis, limousines, and delivery companies. You know, so rather than calling a taxi, which would be five miles away, it would take 15 minutes to come, they had the dispatch technology, great platform, to optimize the routes, the time that you as a, as a customer would wait and, and for drivers. So same kind of optimization that Uber is doing. So we launched the, it was 2017. The platform was so good, in fact, it had nothing to do with me, but the company, Yusuf Fleet, was purchased by Renault Nissan because they are trying to build their, their mobility arm. And today, if you go in Europe, you have, or in Paris, you have the Zoe electric vehicle, and they are using the Yusuf Fleet platform for that, that, that particular aspect. Then continuing on the mobility, I uh, had a chance to work um, with another New York-based startup called Upflex. Uh, which is the mobility of person. And this is quite interesting because this is a platform basically addressing the need for corporations. And today it's very true. Corporations willing to create flexibility for their uh, workspace, for their employees. So imagine you're a sales rep, imagine you're traveling across the world and rather than you know working, connecting to Wi-Fi in the coffee, uh, in the lobby at the hotel, coffee shop, etc. You can just rent an office for an hour, two hours, half a day, meeting rooms. So it's not you're not you know renting for months. It's just super flexible. And today you can imagine the ramification with you know COVID. People with you know you have enough of working at home for a day. You want to escape for an hour, two hours, escape from the kids, from the dogs, etc. And that's what you can do. So Upflex, they in fact they launched a safe, safe space, of course, uh, a network with many different. Uh, uh, co-working space operators. So that's another aspect of the sustainable mobility, so transportation. And then I happened to meet uh, my two partners, uh, uh, Sam and Clem, um, on with this amazing technology. Because I've been in the transportation world, I found the solution absolutely amazing because Clip is just, you know, you have your own bike and you just can transform it in an electric bike today when you want, when you want. And it's not permanent. It's just, you just take it out of the bike and you have a regular bike, you put it on the bike and you are on electric mode. It's light enough that you'll never get stranded. So, you know, based on the, my experience with Nissan Leaf, I know that, you know, there is always the random anxiety. 
here you don't have any range anxiety. An electric bike you would because it's, it's heavy. Here it's not heavy, it's, a, it's affordable. So it's basically bringing you know, a mobility solution to everybody. Two million bikes in, two billion bikes in the world, 170 million bikes in the US, 20 million bikes, new bikes every year. So you can bundle you know, a regular bike with the purchase of clip. So the market is, is intense and I think that's, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, there's uh, there's so much change in the mobility industry right now, and how how do we all, you know, you all who are working in the states um, and with the public sector and other organizations, uh, big and small, like how do we lead the change? How do we lean into this so we can do it well and do it right, and do it better, quite frankly, than we have in the past? Uh, my next question is for John, and John, I'd love to hear more from you about. Uh, what has COVID revealed to us as important and pressing issues when considering sustainable development? Do we, and you've already started to allude to this a little bit, do we see a convergence of health and sustainability, maybe with that greater focus on health that you were talking about earlier, if you could just dive into that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And for context, um, you take a city like New York, 70% of the carbon emissions in New York City come from buildings. Um, it's our largest source, thanks to uh, innovations like Eric's company uh, and bikers and um, our mass transit system. Uh, transportation uh, emissions in New York City is only 28 percent. So that's, um, you know, that's that's not a typical uh, carbon budget for a city. It's because in a normal year, you know, we move about two and a half a billion people uh, uh, by mass transit a year in New York. So what's left are buildings and they play an outsized role, 70% uh, of those emissions. Now, you may find it interesting that the single largest source in buildings and 40% of all carbon emissions citywide come from burning fossil fuels at the building in New York City. What that means is steam heat, and hot water in large multifamily buildings. Those represent 40% of all carbon emissions across New York City. That's greater than all transportation at 28%. This is one of our single largest problems, one of our single largest opportunities. Now I mention that because unlike electricity, when you burn fossil fuels at the building, we're talking about a boiler that's in a building combusting oil or natural gas to create heat. Now we know we need to reduce those emissions for climate change as we mentioned, right? That's 40% of the city's wide emissions. We have to reduce it. What we never talk about is when you burn a fossil fuel, you release NOx, SOx, PM 2.5, other health irritants. And in this case, we're doing it literally in the building. And so this has an enormous health impact and an enormous health benefit if we can find a way to transition these uh, generation sources for heat and hot water to a cleaner source. Now you overlay something like COVID, which is um, a, a, a lung health issue. These are exactly the particulates that we need to remove uh, to improve lung health is NOx, SOx, PM 2.5. Um, and so yes, there's this big benefit, whether it's at the power plant um, and, you know, in New York City, some of our power plants are in the city, some of them are 100 miles away. Equal benefits there. They're, they're spewing out NOx, SOx, PM 2.5. When we convert our power plants, uh, we, we go to a cleaner energy source that not only saves carbon, but promotes public health. And when we do it in the building uh, for these heat and hot water sources, it has the same impact. We need to start talking about that more. Um, and frankly, I think we need to start valuing it more because this may be the way that one helps the other that we can have public health and climate benefits together and for those that were skeptical about the payback for climate change now let's evaluate it in health terms and i think we'll see a different outcome yeah no i think that's that's a points um, that you make and think about all those things and how they work together so you know if we're just taking care of the the burning of fossil fuels in buildings, but not taking care of uh, the energy efficiency of the building itself. Like there's a relationship between the two. If you make the, the building more energy efficient, but you're still building fossil, burning fossil fuels, you're creating a, a terrible situation where you've got more happening. Um, so how do we do these things together and at the same time uh, is important. So thank you for that. 
Um, Mahel, next question is for you. As a provider of digital solutions for public entities, what tools do cities possess or, or lack in better understanding the use of public space, particularly relative to the transportation system, how can cities be better armed to address the needs of the citizens and, and everyone that's out there using the space? Uh, well, uh, that, that's a large question indeed. Um, before I answer it, a, a comment for Eric. Um, uh, I love uh, clip bike and I was just wondering if you guys are shipping to France, I need one. <laughs> so we'll sort it out uh, in a private conversation. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, no, but coming back to the technologies um, and try to elaborate a little bit more on, on the portfolio that the system is developing, because I think it, it really uh, answers part of the question. Um, one of the main things we see these days is the challenge of dealing with enormous amount of data. Um, the, the, the challenge of the people we, we are dealing with, interacting with, and try to support is not anymore to identify uh, data sources. Uh, the problem is to deal with large amount of data and try to make that intelligible to help at the end of the day, decision maker, public decision maker, being in a position to take a decision, being in a position to explain that decision and collaborate with all stakeholders around the administration uh, to uh, once again, capitalize on sort of collective intelligence. And, and that's, uh, that's something we see more and more with the um, cities or, or, or larger territories that are, are uh, working with us and, and we are, we're lucky to work with, is really the ability to represent, to build a, a digital twin of the territory, where they're gonna be able to, number one, understand what's at stake um, and, and work, uh, understand what's at stake, whatever the topic, transportation, uh, buildings, education. So it's uh, basically being in a position to work on public policy efficiency, which is probably one of the first conditions be able to start working on resilience and sustainability. Um, uh, number two, take the decision and make sure everybody understand again what why that decision has been taken and, and collaborate. Collaborate at different levels, at the political level, administration level, and with the citizens themselves to be able to make sure that the decision that has been taken uh, suits their need, um, um, answer their requirements. We do that, I would say, in, in four times. We do that for, as I was saying, public policy efficiency. Second time, anticipation of the CT transformation. Um, in transportation, that we, we have a good example with Singapore, where we've been building on the whole the new design of their um, uh, cycling roads to, uh, to make sure wherever, uh, to make sure they're gonna cope with the uh, increase of demand of people to be able to um, uh, ride their bike in full security. And, and when you wanna create new cycling lines, uh, what's the impact on the rest of the urban areas? And that's in full 3D, completely immersive, where administration, urban planners, experts of mobility and citizens are gonna be able, without being all to get all of them experts, to understand what's at stake. The, the third time is really around crisis, crisis anticipation, and also being able to deal with crisis. You find here again, challenges around the data, but you, you also really uh, find challenges around have people being able to collaborate near real time. Um, we have examples with uh, regions that are more, I mean, handling millions of people. COVID-19, uh, unfortunately, uh, has, uh, has increased this kind of demand where we held them build data observation um, solution, cockpit so-called, where they're gonna be able to track on a daily basis how the pandemic um, is moving. Uh, if I take that decision, what's gonna be the impact on the rate of people in hospital, on the rate of people infected. We do that, by the way, with Capgemini, uh, which is a great partner of us. So I, I'm mentioning it here. And on the crisis as well, on the building, but we can come back to that on a later stage. There are technologies that are, again, scientifically based, coming from the industry um, around simulation that are allowing us today to be able to uh, create safe public environment, where we basically are gonna be able to simulate with a really high uh, rate of uh, fidelity, I mean, accuracy compared to the real, simulate where the COVID-19 in that case, but tomorrow probably other, uh, other particles or other, other challenges um, is, uh, uh, is uh, potentially um, infecting part of the buildings according to the airflow simulation we're performing. Um, that's an answer to immediate crisis to be able to reopen some facilities, but in the way tomorrow we're gonna design buildings, that's also something now we're working with uh, uh, contractors, construction and architects 
to be able to make sure that next generation of buildings will take these kind of new challenges. So I could talk, but uh, but yes, there are a lot of technologies that cities are starting to adopt uh, that has accelerated and 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 uh, and it, it it should it's it's on the right path. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that it's it's an interesting time that we are in, um, particularly with COVID and the economic implications. And obviously, the, in, in this country in particular, and it's a global issue, probably more than we acknowledge it, but the, the racial inequities that are, are across the, the country and across the globe, how do we deal with all these things that are happening all at once? And I, I do think that it provides an opportunity for uh, leadership uh, for us to lean in and do things differently and maybe more quickly. But we're also um, faced with some pretty big challenges, particularly from a funding perspective. And so I'm just curious to get for insight from all of you and your understanding is, you know, we can talk about this from a public-private partnership perspective, and that's something that I'm a, a big proponent of, particularly when we do things on a very strategic level. Like, let's be thoughtful about how we do these public-private partnerships. But when we're faced with a situation as we are right now, where funding is is just you know like cities are trying to survive, how do you guys see, think about that um, moving forward? You know, the private sector obviously is looking to make money um, and, and deliver. You know, many of us are trying to deliver things that will make the, the, our lives better and the world a better place. Um, but how do we do that right now? What's our approach uh, from a fight from a capital standpoint? This is why I'm the moderator. I ask the hard part. <laughs> you might want to pick someone to respond this easy question. <laughs> well, I'll start. I'll okay. my panelists. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we're finally realizing is that solutions to climate change don't come for free. Um, there was you know, I think a period of time in our social and political history where it was like point, like passing the buck, well, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay, well, someone's going to pay for it. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the new climate emissions on New York, that, that burden falls on building owners, which are going through their own, uh, you know, crisis of confidence and economics, uh, you know, with the pandemic. Uh, we just, Urban Green just had a, a, a panel this morning, a commercial occupancy in, in New York City is down 80, 90% right now. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the law that kicks in in, in, in New York uh, starts the first, uh, the, the, it's caps on carbon emission caps on buildings. They start in 2024 and then 2030. Um, it's going to cost billions and billions of dollars of, of any energy upgrades to get there. Now, what we hope is if done right, some of those will have a natural payback for building owners. So the, it is capital intensive for the building owner. But this this can be about investments in their buildings to make it better. But, you know, the, the these are tough conversations and, and, and these, you know, great uh, companies are, are members of Urban Green uh, from the real estate development and owner standpoint. You know, what I tell them and remind them is we are going to pay for climate change. It's just a matter of who and when. Um, eight years ago, Superstorm Sandy hit New York City. It left a $20 billion bill. Um, New York Harbor is up one foot over the last century. Um, sea level rise is greater, disproportionately greater in this part of the country than other places. We already saw one storm event, $20 billion. Um, and so we know this is coming. The other thing that I like to try to frame is that in the buildings industry, at least, it's in our enlightened self-interest to find a way to beat that climate change. New York, remarkably, has $3 trillion of insured coastal properties. I'll say that again. $3 trillion of insured coastal properties. That's twice the GDP of Canada. So from a financial stake standpoint, there's so much on the line that we have to find a way as a coastal city to do this. And it's going to, it's going to be expensive. Um, and those costs are going to have to be borne at all different levels of society. And until we recognize that we're not going to move. The final thing I'll, I'll mention um, in, in re regards to your direct question is there has to be a role for the federal government here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and clearly I think more and more people are seeing that. It's, um, 
it's it's very interesting um you know the, the discussion about public private is always a, a a complex a complex story and i remember when we launched the nissan leaf we had a great product but we could not do it alone and part of what the the public the administration the cities the federal governments the governors and so on can do is also on the education side you know not necessarily incentives from a, from a, from a, from a money perspective but education and and we signed some partnerships with you know cities government you know the, the state of phoenix for instance where the only aspect of the public responsibility was the education you, the utilities were so you know they wanted to know okay are we going to create clusters of you know of energy use and therefore our transformers would burst and so on so they were also involved in that aspect to understand the customer demand which you know at that time they didn't necessarily have smart readers either so there was that 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 aspect of the partnership but um when when i looked at clip for instance you know with covid especially many cities decided let's move with biking in France, you've got 50 euros, you know, to refurbish your old bikes. In, in Milan, in Italy, I think you are getting 70% subsidy on the purchase of an e-scooter or a bike up to 500 euros. And you find those, you know, that aspect of also the, the, the government, you know, having planning, deciding to go one direction and maybe putting a bit of money there, which is tax money indeed, but helping, you know, everybody achieve that same goal which is a public slash private goal and you know it's always then it's going to be local federal and so on and it's uh, i'm not saying we should have incentives but incentives do help initially to launch a new technology or a, a new market opportunity for the citizens for 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 us um i, I mean i'm not sure i, I agree of course uh, most public organizations these days are in a very complex situation financially speaking uh, but but for us as a as a company who is approaching these uh, ecosystem with solution to actually help them spend better um, increase efficiency um, situation is a little bit different we are in a position where we are in between often the city contractor or the territory contractor if we take transportation people that are operating the network on behalf of uh, the city or the city has a contract with them and, and our role is to come and help them understand if the money is wisely spent. So to be honest, um, at an international scale, yes, we, we see uh, the struggle when it comes to finance, uh, I mean, handling better the finance and financing struggle. But um, our job is actually, as I was saying, to work on the efficiency of the public policy. And if tomorrow they want to indeed work on um, uh, reducing uh, uh, carbon emission, uh, improving their relation with their transportation providers, and so on. That that may be involved with them on PPPs. Um, uh, we're, we're here for there, so we're here for that. Um, so so um, for us, the situation is again a little bit different. Uh, we're we're welcome more and more by the public authorities as people, as an entity that can bring solution to help them manage better exactly this kind of complex partnership, extremely complex partnership. Yeah, no, it is a super complicated space um, and, and how we're gonna move things forward. And, and I think too, thinking about it, what's happening here in you know, this country, United States of America versus what's happening globally and our, our cultural and behavioral approaches to things are sometimes different also. There are questions coming in from participants talking about density and um, behavioral change. Uh, so just curious if you all can talk about things from your perspective in terms of where we are now, what maybe has changed with COVID and how things might shift in the future. Uh, how do we think about, uh, you know, as residents of cities, you know, there's often a pushback, maybe not in New York City, but around density. Other places are always like, oh, we don't want any more density. Um, and then our, our behaviors, you know, a lot of, oftentimes we, what we say we want and then how we behave and act aren't necessarily symbiotic. We we often behave differently than what we say we want. So any thoughts on that that you all might want to share, I think would be great for the audience to hear. Well, in a perfect world, density is your friend for sustainability uh, because you can get economies of scale in almost everything. Now, what we're finding is 
there are challenges with that, right? So um, density may not be your friend for public health. Um, and so we're gonna have to find ways to overcome that. And I'm sure we will. Ironically, the law that New York City passed, we, we still have issues with that, that we need to fix. Um, the, the carbon caps placed on buildings uh, it's just a blunt instrument. It's a carbon per square foot uh, by building type. Um, doesn't doesn't really factor what's happening inside the building. Um, and so we have super, super energy efficient buildings in New York City that are lead platinum, if you're familiar with that rating system, for example, that will never, ever, ever comply with this law. Um, and the reason being is they have 10,000 people that work in them in normal conditions. The plug load is just through the roof, but by design, right? You want efficient buildings with many people in them so that you can get those economies of scale. A, a blunt carbon cap doesn't recognize that. And so we have to fix it. One of the things we're looking at and, pro and proposing at Urban Green is that we look at carbon trading for buildings as a means, Chrissy, to answer your first earlier question about how, do, how can we do this more economically? Well, let's drive down cost of compliance Let's use market-based mechanisms. And one way to do that is to trade carbon. If, if we can incentivize building owners to go below their cap, we should do so so they can sell that excess reduction to building owners that can't. Um, that's you know a way that we can overcome what normally is your friend and density should be your friend for sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, if I may add a few things in terms of... Uh density I mean, today when you look at uh, i guess us and europe you've got close to 75 percent of people living in cities right so it's really pretty you know urban environment and projections i guess by 2050 the world in the world it should be close to 70 percent so you know com coming back um those so buildings as john is saying is, is a major a major um contributor to the uh, to the greenhouse gas emissions transportations clogged you know traffic in cities is, is a real problem as as you know population becomes more and more urban so that's also something that needs to be needs to be fixed and i'm just going to quote a, a very interesting example about new york city you know and in terms of behaviors things can change imagine the brooklyn bridge when it was uh, initially um, built there was there were no cars they were for pedestrians they were for uh, buses or you know um, public transport and bicycles, no car. And things have changed dramatically uh, over the last century. You know where we have made space for cars uh, to the detriment of other you know alternative transportation sol solution. Another aspect: 1950 in New York, uh, uh, overnight parking was not allowed. Okay, today you've got 11,000 miles. 11 thousand miles of parking um, uh, reserved for cars and you've got only 12 uh, 1000 miles of um, uh, bike lanes not even mentioning the protected bike lanes so you know if you go you, you put it in perspective in context you know 70 years ago mm, cars were not allowed to park in the city now it's everything about car but i think with with covid and what we're seeing today there might there will be a, you know a lifestyle working from home uh, healthy, you know, you know, hospitals, the health, the healthcare workers still go to work. So we need to find solutions for them. You know, biking is is one solution rather than taking public uh, transportation. They arrive at the hospital, they are safe themselves. They are safe for the patients. And I think it should be interesting to see the, on the post-COVID side what the implications are going to be. But apparently, we all feel good. In fact, working remotely, not going to work every day. And I suspect that's something that's going to stay. So uh, it should be interesting to watch. Yeah, these are all interesting topics. And we've got some folks you know, asking about the density and, and if that's going to be partially permanent or and, and, and what's advisable about that. And you know, it's a little bit different, I think, in, in a city like New York City than maybe some of the other cities across the country um, that aren't quite as dense. Um, but also thinking about um, the how we look at things. So in, in this country, we are probably more apt to look at the short term return on investment and not play the long game. And would be curious to hear from each of you your perspective on does, does COVID as an issue and all the complexities it brings with us, does it push us 
as a country, as a culture, as, uh, to think about things differently and play the long game maybe more than we have before. Maybe on my side, um, uh, the, there is there is a trend that we see a lot in uh, in Europe mainly actually is the rise of uh, what I would what I would uh, very respectfully call mid-sized cities. Uh, so it's it's related mm -hmm. somehow somehow to your uh, question around density. We see a lot of people considering moving to uh, smaller towns, smaller cities, um, greener areas. So, so working working on that, we've been uh, in contact and in U.S. as well and in Canada as well uh, with cities that are now starting to plan. Uh, I know I'm going to face a new growth because this crisis has has changed the way uh, people want to live, and and I see people coming, and I know that in the coming years people will come to me. So I need to work on my urban plan. I need to work on my mobility plan. I need to work on my resilience. Um, and I think that's an interesting phenomenon. I, I don't know. I, I don't know to, to what extent it's it's applicable to uh, uh, New York area or to U.S. But that's something that really in our global engagements we've seen a lot. And and the second thing is um, there is a, a concept that, that that we like very much to think about when we, when we talk about cities is the the serene uh, city. It's it's related to Venice, uh, Italy, La Serenissima, as they, they used to call it, which is basically the idea that. There are no city without an, an issue or a crisis at some point. So, so the idea is not um, um, is not to 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 make sure they're not happening again. Is to be ready uh, when it comes. And, and we see that a lot. This idea of preparedness now coming a lot in the different interactions we have. I was referring at the beginning of this panel discussion to what we do for uh, public buildings or for uh, a center of art. Um, to simulate uh, with the impact or the risk of COVID within these buildings. Uh, that has a lot of uh, interest these days for when it comes to, again, being better prepared so that next time, whatever come, we have the right mindset. It's also a question of mindset. We have the right solution and we have um, the right people as well, ready to deal with uh, with that. So in terms of trend and, uh, and in terms of uh, hopefully uh, uh, long-term transformation, that, that's basically what we've seen a lot. Yeah. Very good. We've got folks commenting on um, the 15 minute city or the 15 minute neighborhood. Which I think yeah, goes back absolutely. To your point. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do we how do we think about that? And it, it's certainly, I think, easier to do in, in some areas than others. Um, you know, more suburban parts of the United States of America, um, North America, maybe in general, where we have very specifically, you know, segregated uses and, and forced people to, to drive is going to be a challenge moving forward, um, but not insurmountable. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask, and we'll, you know, we're gonna try to wrap up here right at one o'clock so that uh, Eastern time, so that we can have time for folks to uh, chat amongst themselves and do some networking. But one of the things that I've been thinking about too is and it's part of it is cultural, I think, and part of it is um, security. So, how do we think about these types of solutions that you're that we're all coming up with um, in the, from an innovation space and doing things differently, playing that long game? How do we think about the the publicly or the, the private privacy issues that are out there with PII? Um, it feels like culturally we're we're sort of both uh, accepting of our private information being out there with, you know, we all, ha we all have one of these and, you know, we kind of like let anyone have our data, at the, at the, but at the same time, we're like, well, you know, you can't know anything about me. Um, and so we, we go both directions and with COVID in particular and looking at the, the success rate in other countries relative to our country, which is not looking very good currently. Um, do you guys have thoughts about that or how do you think that plays into this from a mobility standpoint or from a, a broader perspective? If if I may, maybe on the on the data aspects, um, we give a really big deal to to make sure that um, and, and, and and to make sure that any data uh, that that we are going to have to deal with is uh, completely uh, anonymized or pseudonymized. So uh, the the whole idea, indeed, and, and in Europe, that's uh, that these are there, there are huge discussions these days in Europe about uh, data storage, PII data accessibility and, and full privacy. 
Um, we have really strong, I mean, European Commission is about to uh, legiferate on that. There, there are some strong things coming up. Uh, and we are, as, as a software provider, big supporters of this. Um, so, so I understand the, the idea that when that, that when 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 you grow the amount of technology to offer a service, and uh, the public uh, administration are ha accessing at some point this information to enhance the quality or check better, there could be a fear from people. Uh, and and as a French citizen, we 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 I can testify people are kind of. Uh, uh, re really scared that that we know exactly where they are and what they do. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Here in France, we've had a very low, uh, I mean, download uh, rate of our uh, Stop COVID application. You know, we have released a, a national app. Uh, Dassault system was responsible for the storage of the data, so mm -hmm. so I, I feel comfortable talking about it. I can tell you that um, the level of security, the level of uh, anonymization we put there makes it completely impossible to go back to a single person. And we apply the same for mobility services, for public policies, efficiency. The idea is not to know where people go, what they do. The idea is to help their elected representatives or their administration to uh, uh, help the next generation of service of assets be better uh, for their uh, for their health. Um, I mean, John was referring to the carbon emission, I think that's very important. And there are tools today that can indeed measure, but also help design better the future generations of building so that the emissions are lower. Um, um, and, and indeed for mobility, that's pretty much the same, having safer roads um, uh, and so on. So, and indeed you may need to collect data to achieve that. But again, in a, as a software provider, we're, we're more than careful. We basically don't take data if it's not anonymized. We don't deal with it. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, if all providers do it, uh, and I understand the fear, um, notably these days, I was reading in the US press, Operation Warp Speed around the vaccination uh, technology, which is being developed by a, a US company. Um, I think it's a, it's also a question of mindset and, and corporate responsibility for companies like mine to make sure that we respect this uh, PII when we have to deal with it and 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 and, and fix clear rules and cl clear engagement uh, w when we're working in this kind of uh, of ecosystem. Uh, but 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 I understand that yes, it can create some resistance and some fear. It's uh, it's important that the, the the authorities and companies like ours, like mine, uh, also reassure that we we have the process in place to deal properly with this kind of data. Yeah, and no, I think it's a really important point, Mahal. I'm glad you brought it up. The, you know, the the trust that we need to have, and the uh, looking at things from, from that corporate responsibility, from a, a government, you know, taking care of its its citizens, um, really being thoughtful about the the community benefit that is being provided overall, and how do we how do we continue to build and nurture that trust in maybe a way that it hasn't always been, or we've maybe lost a certain amount um, over the last many years. So uh, work, work to be done for sure. Yeah, but you know, Chrissy, it, if we want to play the long game, we have to be smarter. And yes. we're only going to get smarter if we have more data and we have better data. So yeah. it, it's, it's reality. So we need to figure it out. I'll give you a real-time example um, from a program we held just this morning. You might be surprised to know that uh, commercial occupancy in New York City is down 90%. Guess how much energy is down in those buildings? 30%. Wow. With buildings with 70% energy baseload with nobody in them. Um, and so why is that? Well, it's data that's going to get us to this. And the smarter the building data system is, the more granular we can be to understand what is making up a 70% base building load when nobody is in the building. Um, these are the rich opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, the pandemic, as tragic as it is, is providing us a, a, an ability to rethink traditional norms. Mm -hmm. Data is going to help us do that. I, I mean, John, as we were just discussing before the, the, the meeting, it's interesting in the for the building industry, you can save 20 to 25 percent energy, heating and electricity just by, you know, right sizing again. Right sizing is super important. Your building, the energy consumption, have sensors in the room where, you know, people is, is in the room, then you have the light, people get out, the light switched off automatically. Same thing with the heat. 
25% energy savings without any work. It's just right sizing. And that's exactly what John is saying. You know, you've got 90% of people gone, and you still have, you know, 70% of the energy use. That's because there is no smart sensors, AI based technology, but they are available. So, you know, it's just a matter of getting there. Yeah. Well, thanks to all of you for your input. Uh, we're going to move this into the networking session portion of the session. So everyone who's participating, please feel free to stick around and ask questions. I want to thank each of you, Eric, John, and Mahal, for the work that you're doing, for the leadership that you are exhibiting in the spaces, um, pushing not only yourselves and your organizations, but also everyone around you um, to do more and do better so that we can actually solve some of these very complicated, complex problems faster um, because we have to. And But also keeping that long game in mind. Like it's, it's not gonna turn around in a, in a year or two. Um, it's gonna take longer than that, but we, it takes cur courage, I think, um, and people like you in order to get there. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll ask John to move us in back into the networking session and look forward to talking to more of you there. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.